Hey, Robert Mitchell here. Welcome to my YouTube channel. If you're new in these parts, I am an author, a martial artist, a seminarian, and a deacon in the old Catholic tradition. So what are we talking about today? Fear is the fulcrum. Now, what is a fulcrum? A fulcrum is the thing that you put under the, that the lever goes over to help you lift things. And so, if you understand fear, I think you can begin to understand the crux of certain things. It'll help you, it's the pivot point that will help you understand how a number of things in the world work. Now I'm going to give you a quote here at the beginning and I promise to get back to it at the end. We're going to work our way back to that quote. And this is a quote by theologian Paul Tillich. Finitude in realization is anxiety. And so when you realize that you are finite and that you are going to die, then you are experiencing anxiety immediately. Um, you're not getting out of this thing alive. And so that's where, that's the ultimate existential crisis. So you, So why is fear so such a pivotal point to understanding um, so many issues? Well, let's, let's start with my personal story, which I think you might find illustrative. So my life was a total shambles in 1986, and I had difficulty with working and jobs, and I was lazy, and everything was a total shambles. Uh, I um, couldn't make enough money to make ends meet. And I was a, a crappy husband and a crappy dad, and I was 85 pounds overweight, and everything was a complete disarray. So uh, I had heard that martial arts might be good for might be good for uh, discipline, and so I decided to take up martial arts, and I did. And so within a year or two, I had lost over 80 pounds of weight, and I had doubled my income. And I was beginning to put my life together. And it would take many, many, many years of work to do so. But eventually, I feel like I kind of stopped being quite so reprehensible. Uh, got my black belt in 1989. And then I continued to move through martial arts after that. So um, I read this book uh, by Matt Rosano, Supernatural Selection, How Religion Evolved. And I was blown away by a few things. And I was blown away particularly when I read a couple of really cool passages about the evolution of, of ritual. All right? So... When I read this, I saw my martial arts class. Immediately, I saw my martial arts class. So let me explain this to you. This is from page 82. Ritual is a rule-governed and generally rigid, sequenced pattern of behavior that is attention-getting and formalized. For example, consider scrotum grasping a common ritual used for social bonding among male baboons. Two males wishing to signal friendship will take turns briefly holding each other's testicles. Grabbing and ripping at the genitals is common when primates fight. Thus, the scrotum grasp can be understood as a ritualized version of the fighting action. However, it is a formalized or more restricted form of the fighting action a momentary grasp rather than an aggressive grabbing and ripping. The act itself is undoubtedly attention-getting, and it follows a rule-governed, relatively invariant sequence. One baboon strides up to another using a rapid, straight-legged gait. As he approaches, he looks directly at the other baboon, making affiliative gestures such as smacking his lips, flattening his ears back, and narrowing his eyes, the other responds in like fashion, and then after a quick hug, they present their hindquarters and the fondling begins. Building increasingly complex social arrangements undoubtedly put pressure on many aspects of late 
hominin social life, late Pleistocene hominin social life. So, attention grabbing, because of its attention grabbing quality, ritual creates the conditions for extended social interactions. And so what I found out, and what I saw in this I left out loud, I thought of my martial arts class. And I thought of how when you're doing, uh, let's say, uh, traditional martial arts, maybe you're doing, um, let's say, one-step sparring, and then the one person attacks, and the other person blocks, and then punches and stops just short. So it's a ritualized form of combat made safe. It helps you overcome the fear of the partner so that you and your partner can work together. So you simulate a fight, and then you train to prepare against a real fight. And so the, 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 the ritualized fight is a double effect. It bonds you with the person in class with you and encourages you both to be able to train more effectively. And then it also prepares you for a real fight by making you not freak out when hands and feet are flying. And as far as the, so, the scrotum grasp, it just, you know, the first time that someone has you on the bottom and they're on top and they have you on a top wrist lock or something, and they're ready to just rip your arm off, and then you gently tap them to let you go. That is exactly what that is. That's the modern thing. And so what I realized was that the reason why I was a the reason why martial arts helped me stop being a reprehensible person was that they helped me overcome various types of fear. So being afraid to compete with others. In other words, I knew that I was fat and unattractive and um, reprehensible in almost every way. So why would I want to risk competing with other people in the marketplace uh, for, let's say, a really good job? Uh, because I knew that I would certainly be found out as being lazy and, you know, no good. So why would I even try? And then why would I try to make friends? Because those friends are just going to find out that I don't have any integrity and so forth. So as you overcome one sort of fear, it begins to spread. And so then you're, you feel confident that you can, you know, actually, maybe I'm not so bad. You know, I was able to do this, these rituals with my, you know, with my classmates. And so now suddenly I'm rising in rank and I'm, I'm progressing through the stages and I'm learning things. And so you gradually overcome fears. Fear, is, overcoming the fear is what builds you up and allows you to move forward. All right. But I'm gonna I'm gonna go and I'm gonna skip to this article here. This is another article by uh, the same author as as this book by Matt Rosano. If ritual is good, then ritual infused with the supernatural is even better. This is what our ancestors discovered thousands of years ago. Our ancestors were singing, dancing, and chanting together long before anyone conceived of the supernatural. Religion was born when already existing social rituals became supernaturalized. Initially, the supernatural was probably envisioned as just a vague healing force, accessible only through a ritually induced altered state of consciousness. By including the supernatural, community rituals that had incidental health and healing effects became shamanistic rituals of individual and community healing. These healing rituals were real. Anxiety levels were reduced. Immune systems were strengthened, pain tolerance was increased, social bonds were reinforced, and participants' mental and emotional states were elevated. In short, life was made better. Matt Rosano is the world's foremost expert in the evolution of religion. Uh, he probably would differ with that, but I think he is. He's a modest guy, it seems. So why is it that the supernatural element actually improves things? How is that, how is that possible? So 
A number of recent studies, this is from page 53, have demonstrated the power of perceived public scrutiny in generating pro-social behavior. So when subjects play the game on a computer, that then in one condition, there was an image of a cute looking robot face on the screen as the game was played. When the subjects were under the gaze of the cute little robot named Kismet, donations to the communal pot increased 30% compared to when donations were done privately. The mere suggestion of public scrutiny affects us at a more primal, unconscious level. The same automatically triggered anxiety-provoking nervous system mechanisms that warn us of physical threat very likely kick into action at the faintest hint of public observation. So I'm sure you're familiar with the honesty box concept. So there's, uh, there's the idea of an honesty box, like, like say it's a box of, uh, of treats or snacks, a snack box, and then you're, you pay for them on an honesty basis, right? So, you know, so... Melissa Bateson and her colleagues Dan, da Daniel Nettle and Gilbert Roberts put up a snack box and then they alternated it with a poster of either flowers or a pair of eyes. They found that during the week when the eyes were present, the average contributions to the honesty box increased threefold. Our brains are programmed to respond to eyes and faces, whether we are consciously aware of it or not. And then from another study, it says, In sum, we are suggesting that the activation of God concepts, even outside of reflective awareness, matches the input conditions of an agency detector, and as a result, triggers this hyperactive tendency to infer the presence of an intentional watcher. So you can well imagine that, let, let's say, uh, two cultures. Uh, and then the one culture has no deity. They just have moral rules that are perceived to be better. And in that culture, uh, when you're by yourself, you say, well, no one's watching. Why should I follow the rules when no one's watching? But in the other culture, let's say that they have, uh, gee, I don't know, let's say they have ancestor worship. And uh, they believe that their ancestors live on and that they can see them or that their spirits walk among them. And so when they're alone, they say to themselves, I can't misbehave. I can't steal, let's say, when, I, when no one's watching because my granddad, my grandfather, my mother, my grandmother, they're all watching me. And so therefore, I cannot steal. Plus, if you add into that the health effects that you get from, from deity. So this is from the religion and health section. Now, get a load of this. There's been considerable discussion concerning the role of religion in health and healing. Numerous studies have provided evidence that religious people are healthier and happier, live longer, and recover faster from illness and surgery. Religious beliefs have been found to predict positive outcomes following hip and heart surgery. The degree of strength and comfort that one receives from religion is associated with faster recovery and greater longevity following heart surgery. Now, it doesn't seem to help on every form of surgery. It didn't seem to help much with spinal surgery. Um, and uh, he jokes and says... Uh, all the placebo effect in the world isn't going to save you if been stomped on by a woolly mammoth. Matt has a great sense of humor. By the way, I did a really fun, had a really fun phone conversation with Matt, and I hope to do a, an interview or a subsequent video with him on, online at some point. And I'm trying to organize a three-way conversation between him, myself, and uh, uh, Pastor Paul Vanderclay. But uh, I'm trying to get through to Paul right now. In any event, he's got a sense of humor. It's a fun book. A general enhancement of well-being typically pays off in longevity. Twelve of thirteen studies addressing religion and longevity have found positive associations, and many of these studies find that association 
despite significant, I mean, and many of these studies find that the association remains significant even after controlling for a variety of demographic, social, behavioral, and health-related factors. One study of over 5,000 people in Alameda County, California, was for three decades, and it found that religious involvement was associated, associated with a 23% likelihood, reduction in the likelihood of dying during the study period. Another study, a 28% reduction in mortality over the study period. So if ritual works, then supernaturally infused rituals work even better. Now this was about fear, and I promise I'm going to get back to that. I'm going to get back to that in just a minute. So many people want to say that religion came about in a different way. So back to this article. Two juxtaposed images of religion. A priest in ancient Egypt moaning out an elaborately ritualized incantation over the mummified body of a dead pharaoh. And Tevya and his friends from Fiddler on the Roof drunkenly dancing and shouting Ichayim, Lachayim, to life. Both images tell us something about the origin of religion. The first is probably better known. Religion, it is often claimed, arose amidst humanity's anguish over death. Humans have long ago invented comforting myths about a loving God and a blissful afterlife in order to cope with the intolerable awareness of personal mortality. Now, Matt says, while there's probably some truth to this, it's unlikely to be a complete explanation for why religion emerged. A serious problem with it is that religion often intensifies death anxiety as much as it mollifies it. For example, Apuch, the Mayan god of the dead, was a gruesome character whose putrid, decomposing skeletal form offered little in the way of consolation to new arrivals. The ancient Greeks had a similarly disheartening view of the afterlife. In Book 11 of the Odyssey, dead Achilles laments to Odysseus, Say not a word in death's favor. I would rather be a paid servant in a poor man's house than king of kings among the dead. So, as much as we have heaven, we also have eternal torment. So, is it really all that much of an antidote? Let's think about that a little bit more. In his recent book, The Faith Instinct, Nicholas Wade discusses genetic studies indicating that three traditional societies, the Kung, San of South Africa, the Andaman or Andaman Islanders of Southeast Asia, and the Australian Aborigines very likely represent humanity's most ancient populations. The latter two, in fact, may trace back to the earliest out of Africa migration of Homo sapiens. Common to all three are religious rituals involving vigorous, highly emotional, night-long sessions of singing and dancing ritualized singing, dancing, and chanting, and the alterations of consciousness associated with them are known to produce powerful psychophysical health and healing effects. Clinical studies in musical theory have shown that steady, soothing rhythms used pre-surgically can reduce patient pain and anxiety and promote faster recovery. Rowers pulling together rhythmically have higher pain and exhaustion thresholds. People who move in synchrony together treat each other with greater cooperativeness and generosity. Now imagine, again, calling back to the martial arts things. Ten people in a row all doing their martial arts forms together, right? Uh, 
soldiers in ranks marching along at the singing the same songs, right? Adding the supernatural further enhances these effects. Two recent studies have shown that ritualized meditative practices that include a supernatural element produce stronger psychophysical effects than purely secular ones. In one study, volunteers were randomly assigned to one of three groups practicing meditative relaxation techniques. A group that used a spiritual mantra such as God is love or God is peace and a secular group that says I am happy or I am joyful and a control group that used neither and those practicing the spiritual meditation were able to keep their hands in near freezing water twice as long on average as the other groups. Additionally, the spiritual group showed greater anxiety reduction and mood elevation. So if the ritual works, it works better with God in it. Now this effect has been replicated in another study where electric shock was delivered to both devout Catholics and atheist agnostic volunteers. Both the religious and non-religious subjects were pre-tested for equivalent levels of pain sensitivity. Subjects were then tested in two sessions where electronic shock was administered to the hand while viewing either a religious image or a matched non-religious image. Catholic subjects showed a significant increase in pain threshold when viewing the religious image. No changes in pain threshold were found for non-religious subjects. Catholic subjects also showed increased activity in the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex an area of the brain known to be involved in the evaluation of sensory experience, including pain. Similar activation was not found in non-religious subjects. So again, singing, dancing, and chanting are fun, and adding the supernatural intensifies the experience, making it even more fun. This is why religion endures. So, viewed with a lot wide lens, he says, it's easy to wonder, it's, it's easy to see why institutional religions survive corruption, hypocrisy, and other self-destructive tendencies. Because they're so powerful and they work so well. Now, in this increasingly secularized age, um, at least in the Western world, you know, in the in the uh, in Africa and the third world in China, um, religions uh, is booming. Uh, people are converting to Christianity like crazy. It's only here in the West that people are leaving religion behind, and uh, I would say to their detriment. But um, they're doing that left and right. And if you notice, something happened in the martial arts in the 90s, and so the same thing that began to happen to the in the religious world began to happen in the martial arts world. And so we saw this tendency to edit out all of the overtly spiritual and ritualized elements of martial arts. And so the whole idea was, well, you know, it doesn't work. And so only what works. And so the, the same materializing tendency that's, that caused that the people used to, to push religion out of their lives, they used to push the, the, everything, all the ritual out of martial arts. So they edited out the uniforms and all of the ritualized movements and uh, the moving in synchrony and the rows and the bowing and they pulled all of that out and all the meditation and all the contemplation and all of that. And so they were left with what they have now, which when you pull it out, all you have left is basically blood sport. And so then blood sport becomes martial arts. But I ask you, if we know empirically and scientifically that ritual works, that it actually does increase your pain tolerance, that it actually does uh, provide tangible physical benefits, then why in the Sand Hill would we leave it 
out? Why would we make it go away? It's not practical. It's not sensible because it works. And finally, I'll leave you with this fantastic passage here from uh, the, the, the Varieties of Religious Experience by William James. So he's talking about how, about a bad attitude and how the, the, the whining, puling um, attitude doesn't work, all right? The Christian spurns the pinched and mumping sick room attitude, and the lives of the saints are full of a kind of callousness to disease, conditions of body, which probably no other human records show. But whereas the merely, merely moralistic spurning takes an effort of volition, the Christian spurning is the result of the excitement of a higher kind of emotion in the presence of which no exertion of volition is required. The moralist must hold his breath and keep his muscles tense so long as this athletic attitude is possible all goes well. Morality suffices. And so I'm reminded of, reminded of the many, 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 many atheists and celebrity atheists included who say, why can't we just be good? Because we can't and we won't. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work as well as it does when you have a supernatural element. The moralist must hold his breath and keep his muscles tense, and so long as this athletic attitude is possible, all goes well. Morality suffices, but the athletic attitude tends ever to break down, and it inevitably does break down, even in the most stalwart, when the organism begins to decay or when morbid fears invade the mind. Remember what I told you at the beginning? Paul Tillich, finitude in realization is anxiety. To suggest personal will and effort to one all sicklied over with the sense of irremediable impotence is to suggest the most impossible of things. So in other words, someone who is in the most degraded conditions possible to say, just do good. Just pick up your bootstraps and get moving. It's absurd. It doesn't make any sense, right? What he craves is to be consoled in his very powerlessness, to feel that the spirit of the universe recognizes and secures him, all decaying and failing as he is. Well, we are all such helpless failures in the last resort. The sanest and best of us are of one clay, with lunatics and prison inmates, and death finally runs the robustest of us down. And whenever we feel this, such a sense of the vanity and provisionality of our voluntary career comes over us that all our morality appears but as a plaster, hiding a sore it can never cure, and all our well-doing as the hollowest substitute for that well-being that our lives ought to be grounded in, but alas, are not. And here religion comes to our rescue and takes our fate into her hands. There is a state of mind, known to religious men but to no others, in which the will to assert ourselves and hold our own has been displaced by a willingness to close our mouths and be as nothing in the floods and waterspouts of God. In this state of mind, what we most dreaded has become the habitation of our safety, and the hour of our mortal death has turned into our spiritual birthday. The time for tension in our soul is over, and that of happy relaxation, of calm, deep breathing, 
of an eternal present with no discordant future to be anxious about has arrived. Fear is not held in abeyance as it is by mere morality. It is positively expunged and washed away. So, ritual can only take you so far without a supernatural element. And I would so go so far as to say that the entire story of humanity, and if you read this book, and I encourage you to do so, you will find that religion saved humanity from extinction. And I would go so far as to say that if it works, it's probably true. Thank you and God bless.